So we're big, we're bad, and we're back at Sweetwater with Ryan Lennox. How are you? Doing great. Good, good, good. So Ryan, while we were here, challenged us to come up with a top five in many different subjects. And depending on which order these videos are going to get released, you may have already seen the microphone one, and you realize me coming up with the top five in anything is going to be impossible. So we did come up with a top five and then added like another five or ten. So this may happen again. So what are we going to do? What's our top five now? This is, oh, it's not obvious. Oh, uh, well, signal chain after the microphones, whether you put an EQ or a compressor before each other, whatever it may be. But it's very pivotal to me, from my understanding, to shape the sound before you go into the presser with an EQ. It depends, you're right. It depends on the situation. Yep. But strictly outboard EQs. Strictly outboard EQs. And there will, of course, be a preamp video. You can find that around there as well. This is in a no particular order. But because the obvious thing you can see here is API, so why don't we start off with API? I actually have quite a lot of API external EQs, even though people will know us from having an SSL 4000, owning a lot of Poltex. Get there in a second. The thing about APIs is, well, first of all, you see this thing here? It's called a 500 series. They invented this. This is their invention. The way that their consoles were made, much like, of course, Rupert Neve console here, the 5088, is a completely modular. And this was a very, very smart idea back in the late 60s and early 70s, because if something went wrong, you basically unscrewed it, pulled it out, put a new module in it, and you were up and rocking. Studio time probably still today, but definitely in those days, was bleeding expensive. It was so expensive. So nobody wanted to sort of shut down a session because you needed to sort of open up the lid of a console and go in there with a soldering iron and try and fix it, you know. So they made everything modular and easy to uh, remove. So what then happened is, I don't know what point, probably the 90s or whenever, people started making 500 series racks, which for those of you watching that haven't quite got into that world yet, it's pretty amazing. Absolutely. It's a great way to give yourself some more front end flavor or even, yep. you know, uh, you know, insert sure. flavor on and on any system at home or in a commercial studio. It doesn't matter. You can it, they're fairly accessible now. Very accessible. What I love about it of course is you can get in there with some affordable things and then flip them out and get other things and yeah. Loads of different flavors, but I suppose I would be lying if I didn't say that a 500 series API EQ isn't a standard, and I, I'm saying that word again, industry standard, but the reason why I, like, I talk about API, and we have no brand loyalty here, this is just about what we love, whether it's API or of course Neve, Poltec in a minute we'll get to, but when it comes to like hardware solid state EQs, the thing about API and Neve that's so powerful and important is like so many of the records that we grew up listening to pre SSL world pre sweepable parametric or semi parametric EQs everything was done at a fixed EQ point so if you get for instance a kick drum you're going to go to 50 hertz and then go boost and that is your low end of your kick drum mm -hmm. so when people ask me how do I get a sound say of ACDC I always say to them either use hardware or a plug-in of a Neve 1073 mm -hmm. and go to 60 hertz and boost it. Mm -hmm. If you want an American kick drum classic sound from that period, go to 50 hertz and boost it. Then, of course, you can go in there and go, well, what about um, 240? I can go to 240 and then cut and pull out some of that ugly low mids. And then maybe I want a little bit of bite. So what do we got? We've got a bit of 3K here. We've got a bit of 1.5. I'd probably go 3K on most standard classic rock kick drums and do a little bit of cut. And immediately, you've got a classic sound of a kick drum. Yeah. So there is something to be said for using, I'm doing it again, industry standard kind of things. They're very familiar. It's like we talk about 57s, we talk about 1073s, we talk about you know, 512s, 312s, 212s. These are things that we all know and love because they've been on every other recording we've ever heard. But it's more than that. API EQs sound incredible. Absolutely. They're really, really great things. And, and it's a, I found it was a very easy way for me to learn, to get onto a console where I had fixed points. And my brain made sense. I was like, okay, 50. And then when I came to the bass guitar, you know, on, the, on this in particular, on a B, I've got 75 or 150 that I can kind of boost. And 
It's, it's not quite jigsaw puzzle-ish, but it's a little bit, and you start to understand the relationship between the instruments. Anyway, 550B, classic, classic. And uh, the A's, of course, with the three band, the 560s, the, the graphics are phenomenal. We have permanently have a 560 on our kick drum channel and one permanently on our snare drum channel for shaping EQ. Absolute industry standards, API EQs. Ryan was pointing out before we get started that we should have, you know, 19-inch rack mount stuff available as well, and I think it's very, very powerful. So here, of course, you've got a pair of these as a rack mount. Lots of people still like to buy rack mount stuff because the power supplies in these are very dependable. There's nothing wrong with 500 series units, but make sure you buy a good one. Don't yes. buy a really cheap one because if the power supplies are not very good, Everybody like Paul Wolf, the genius Paul Wolf, will tell you if you're not supplying proper current to 500 series equipment, it actually affects the sound quite dramatically. And here at Sweetwater, we only make sure that we picked up uh, the companies that build the chassis to make sure that you have a right. clean power supply going on the 500 series. Because that you don't sell any crappy cheap ones. Basically. <laughs> well, yeah. we that was that was a big problem yeah. when you know in the beginning of these, and even uh, in the past couple decades, I would say yeah. was people were having issues with the power supplies. It would it would destroy them. It blow them up. Oh dear. Or, or underpower them. Completely yeah, fixed now. Yeah, if you underpower it, it sounds terrible. Yeah, but. absolutely. But yeah, it's, it's uh, issues fixed now. Sweetwater only, kill, only carries the best. Okay, good. <laughs> Glad to hear it. Um, so yeah, if you're a rack mount person and you don't have a 500 series or you already have a full rack of 500 series stuff, obviously, stereo version of the 550 here is pretty tasty mm. and very easy to use. Now, moving on. I don't know if this is my favorite but it's close to being one of my favorite EQs of all time. And when we were doing the microphones, we were talking about how I love versatility in microphones, microphones that could do 50 jobs, but also I have a love of things that do one job really, really well, and that's just as important to me. Sometimes having something that does one job really well is also worth its weight in gold, especially when it does it so well as this. This, now, Steve Jackson, who owns this company, he went to Gene, the original owner, Poltech, Pulse Techniques, as his full name is, and got very close to him and has all the original schematics and makes these exactly like they were made. Now you're looking at this going, well, he didn't have a 500 series. No, they didn't. But what they did do, and it's a nice segue, is have a relationship with API. So inside of the solid state Poltex are 2520s, proper API 2520s, made in conjunction with the license from API themselves. This is my favorite bass guitar EQ. And not only is it my favorite bass guitar EQ, everybody that ever came to Spitfire with the SSL plug in a bass and be like, how do you have the best bass tone? And all I would do is turn off the insert and it would go back to sounding like everybody else's bass. And then I put the insert back on and all this blooming low end that didn't seem to fight with the kick drum would come in and everybody would be amazed. Well. It is this. It is this. I can tell you at least four bass players that went out and bought one of these immediately afterwards. John Button from The Who, uh, my old friend, bought one of these specifically. So when he does remote sessions and records bass at home, puts it through this. So go to this, go to 100 hertz, boost it. It is amazing. You can attenuate it, which means you can kind of control it because um, I'm sure you all know that Poltex are shelf EQ. So when you boost it, if you boost 100 hertz, you're also boosting everything below it. So the attenuation can kind of narrow that a little bit and control it. But it is absolutely gorgeous. This is, well, and also 3K, by the way, while we're at it. If you go to the 3K area, just to get that pick sound or get a bit more fingers on that, boost that like crazy as well, and you get some articulation. For the price, it's not cheap, but for the price, it is the ultimate way to get an amazing bass tone. Now, of course, a pair of these you could use on absolutely anything. But yes, um, I spoke to Steve uh, over at uh, Poltech at Pulse Techniques, and yeah, he says these are a massive seller because you're getting a Poltech sound for about a third of the price of the 19-inch rack mounts. And I don't want to say this out loud, but I'm going to. I don't know, I'd probably buy one of these first. If I was going to get into Poltex, get this. Mm. And if it's just only you use it to mix bass guitar, you are going to love me for telling you to put it on your bass guitar. This is a phenomenal. And it's ridiculous, actually, because it's, it's, this is heavy. This is about twice as heavy. I don't know what it's got jammed in here. I mean, that's pretty heavy. It's well made. But think about how little that is and how much it weighs. Oh. It's got a lot of components in there. Yeah. 
I mean, he's, he's a genius. I think he said it took him a long time to figure out how to condense everything in a Poltec yeah. into a 500 series. Obviously, they don't need a power supply in it. Yeah. But yeah, it, it must be rammed like right up to within an inch of its life. And I know some engineers that do run stereo Poltec on their master bus. Yeah, yeah. You could put it on the master bus. Yeah. We have a pair. It could be done. I will have one of the original originals. I think they've, uh, they, oh, this is the newer one. So this has got the X on it. Yes. And it does sound exactly the same. It might just be slightly better. But <laughs> phenomenal. I, I cannot recommend that EQ higher. And once again, these are all EQs that we use every single day. All right, next on our list is the great Marg. Now, you might know, if you don't, and you, if you ever go to AES or NAM, Cliff and his sons, he runs it with his sons, have a booth there and they are the nicest guys in the world. But they also make an industry standard EQ. I can think of 10 famous mixers that have these on their mix buses or at least somewhere in their mix. There is what is known as the Airband. Now, the Airband, I think, is at, what, 30K or something? Sounds right. I know that, you know, Ripper Neve and his affiliated the other companies have the air feature built into them. I'm, yeah. I was, I've of course, have heard of Mog Brendan Studios before, but I've never actually heard one through its paces. Is it? This is a phenomenal EQ. It, I mean, it's it's probably the GML, um, which I believe is over here, is beyond an honorable mention. George Massenberg's EQ is another industry standard. It is definitely between the GML, which is more surgical, or the the Mog EQ4. Both of them are absolutely phenomenal, depending on your pricing structure, you know, which one you go for. They're both phenomenal. The thing about the airband, and it's, it's kind of logical, um, and this is very Jack Douglas, Shelley Yakis, James Cena, all those amazing New York engineers of the late 60s and 70s and 80s that made the greatest sounding records. They all love this principle, which is to go way above or way below what you actually want to boost and boost there, because then you get a gentle slope. So that was what was always beautiful about the Poltex is you could boost low, low and like bring up a gentle slope on the low end rather than just kind of like getting that what a lot of people call when people say, oh, it sounds too EQ'd. What they mean is you've probably gone to the fundamental that you want to boost and you boost it up and it just becomes like, oh, like this boosted all frequency. Yeah, all boxy sounding. Exactly. Well said. So with the air at 30K, that might sound silly. Only a bat can hear it. Yeah, but 30K boosted creates this beautiful, gentle, very, very well-constructed curve that goes right down, you know, to like the seven or eight and above and just creates this amazing high end that is never brittle, never, it doesn't exaggerate S's and T's, it doesn't make cymbals sound ugly, it just adds an overall kind of air to everything. It's an incredibly, I don't, no, I wish Cliff was here. I could ask him what he did. But whatever he did, he did it amazingly well. And I can, I'm, I'm visualizing studios at the moment. I know, I know Pensado has one and Bob Horn has one. And I don't know, everybody I know has one. And they just sit there and they go to the 30K and they just boost it until they start to hear that whole high end lift without it becoming brittle. And it is phenomenal. Now, don't, don't get me wrong. It does so much more than that. It's just that's the immediate thing that it's famous for. You can get into mid range detail. You can get in there, control the low end. It is an amazing EQ. Um, and everything I'm saying here is what we would use every single day of our lives. Um, we do have a pair of like rack mount EQP 1As, mastering bus ones with the steppable on our master bus as well, Steve's as well. But we've given the love to Poltec here. I think it's their best value for money. Um, I think the best value for money outside of that is probably to go through the EQ for Marg's EQ. Mm. So those of you that have followed us for a while know that for many, many years, up until very recently when we got an Audion console and still have our Cadet console and many other things, we had an SSL 4000. And the SSL EQs are some of the best and probably also most famous EQs of all time, particularly, of course, in mixing. Now, I think it was maybe about a year ago, they had a massive price drop. It was ridiculous, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. yeah. They have brought their stuff down like to a very competitive level where now we can really talk about their 500 series stuff as being something that's accessible by everybody. Where before it was a little bit more expensive and people would cherry pick a couple of things. Now I've seen a lot of people adding them to their 500 series racks because they can get compression and EQ and pre's and everything, gates, expanders. So 
Eric's gonna pick up the camera and we're gonna go over here and look at some SSL EQs. So here it is, here's some 500 series SSL stuff. It's absolutely phenomenal. Now, you've got the EEQ here, which we had some of these in our console. We had a real match, a mix and match of, of, of the brown and the black EQs and the oranges and the reds and the whatever. It was a lot of fun. This just, it's just classic semi-parametric EQs. Now, obviously on the low end here, especially for mix, I just go to bell, go to 60 hertz, boom. I'll come in here at about 350. I'll narrow the band and then I'll cut it. So it's parametric. EQ, I can choose it, cut it. I mean, already I'm hearing a kick drum in my head. Um, looks like they've had theirs about 5K, they've gone quite narrow. I'm using more of a, like a 2.5-ish guy for classic rock stuff, um, and then boost. I mean, to me, that's a kick drum. That's a classic sound of a kick drum. And then of course, you know, if I was to go over here and go snare, I'd probably come in about 100-ish to 200, 220 for a Neve, obviously he's quite famous for that. Um, I see they've, they're pulling out some 800, probably some honkiness they didn't like, and they're boosting 6K, and they're boosting some 12. That's probably was the snare. So, I mean, along with APIs, which we used going in, you know, the, the graphic or over here, the 550As going in, this, to me, SSL EQ on the mix stage is really Pretty much a classic sound of rock and roll from like, I think a 4000 came out in 1978, for those of you that remember, probably better than me. And right the way through to probably only about 10 or 15 years ago, pretty much every hit single was mixed on an SSL. There was at some point some crazy claim that the, the top 40 was like 90% SSL mixed. Now, obviously, that has changed dramatically as people are moving in the box, but so many of us are using hardware, either on the recording process or in the mix process, or frankly, using SSL's own plugins. So whatever you do, this is a sound that you'll be familiar with. It's an, a phenomenal way. And like I said, they drop their prices dramatically so that people that have 500 series can really access their stuff. So yeah, I've known and loved this for decades. If you want to go with classic EQs, you cannot beat SSL for this. So here's a 550A talking of uh, API EQs. It really is a simple three band. So I could go 50 hertz here, boost. You know, 400 is, is what I would cut on a kick. I'd probably, get, well, I wouldn't probably, I'd definitely go to 2.5. So here I've got 50 hertz boost, 400 cut, 2.5 boost. That to me is the sound of a kick drum. If I want to go to snare, I'd probably go to either 100 or 200, depending on how low I want to go. Then I can decide, you know, probably won't do anything with the mid-range. Typically when I'm printing, I save for mixing, but definitely go to about 7K. Some people go to 10 and then boost quite dramatically and I'll give you the snap. I mean, it's a quick and easy way to print kick and snare into, and toms as well, like 100 on a tom boost, you know, with again, cut a 400, like if I go to 100 there, uh, cut 400 here, you know, it's, it's toms as well. It just makes your life so easy. If you print through that on the way in, and then you come to mix, you, you've only got a little bit of digital schmidge tool that you need to do. You've already kind of shaped the sound going in. So last but no means least, I'm a big fan of Phoenix, Phoenix Audio, and I don't give them enough love because they're just in our 500 series rack. Yeah. But every stereo pair of rhythm guitars that we've ever done in a mix goes through the Phoenix Gyrator really? EQ. Yeah, it all started back in the, here's the big name drop, but it all started back when we did the Aerosmith record because Joe's guitars, Joe's has a really, really bright guitar sound. And then Brad is bright as well. He was using these, I can't remember what they're called, like third power. Well, anyway, these amps were like so bright. And we were using 122V um, mics on them, which had have a really nice smooth top end. So we were definitely, there's the Royals again. So we were definitely like kind of taming the high end. But we found that the Phoenix, when we came to mix, just had a really great sweet spot that you could really, really tame the high end. You could actually boost it where you needed to, to make it cut without it ripping your ears off. Um, very, very underrated. Now, I'm not an expert on the gyrator EQ, um, either the gyrators or inductor bass. I know people love them for many, many colorful reasons, just mm -hmm. like, like they like uh, Poltex. There's something very special about it, but 
if you want to tame high end on guitars and also sculpt it, the Phoenix Gyrator EQ um, is one of our favorites. And like I said, it's permanently on our guitar bus, on the insert, plugged in, and I forget they're there, which is really quite sad because, you know, we're doing mixes all the time like that, not name checking the fact that, you know, Phoenix make incredible stuff. We also have an eight channel mixer that they make, which is really, really good, and an eight channel bunch of mic pre's mm -hmm. that, it's a phenomenal on the drum kit and very affordable. So Phoenix Audio, give them a shout out. Really, really great stuff. Yeah. And with EQs, I feel like when anybody getting started in recording, yep. they treat EQ as a fix and not a mix. Yeah. Especially if you're in the box, right? Yep. Outboard EQs, I feel like, is more of polishing going into the front end, so it takes the work off the back end. Yep. So these aren't honorable mentions. They are, because we were asked to do five. Yeah. But these are, these are two extra ones that are crammed into the top five. So it's 5.1 and 5.2. And that both of these are, of course, the beautiful Rupert Neve here, which is the 5052, which we have had a blast doing the masterclass here and absolutely love. And of course, you cannot go anywhere without mentioning a 1073. And for my money... The 1073 that I most love that we keep coming back to is, of course, BAE's 1073. Now, don't get me wrong. Many, many people make it. And I think budget-wise, depending on what your budget, you can go in with, with Warm, you can go in with Heritage. But the BAE 1073 EQ is something, and we've been using them, I want to say, first record I did using BAE was 99 or 2000, right at their inception. And the EQ points on a 1073 are completely musical. When we talk about API having, you know, a specific sound because of the EQ points, well, with the 1073, you've got 60 hertz, especially for the low end, for your kick. You've got 110 for your bass, and you've got 220 for the snare. It's almost, it does the work for you. When people say to me, how do you get the ACDC drum sound? I say, first of all, you better hire ACDC drummer. Right. You better get a drum kit and tune it the way they did. Those, those are the two most important things. Obviously, you get a room that they would have recorded in to get that. But the next thing is, whether it be hardware, which I would prefer on the way in, of course, or software when you come to mixing, that's kind of a secret. You get that relationship. Boost the 60 hertz on the kick. Take the bass guitar. Boost the 110 on it. Take the 220 on the snare. Dave Jordan always used to say to me, that was the Mutt Lang sound. The classic Mutt Lang sound was the kick in the stomach and the, and, and the snare low end on the chest. So it was like, kick, da, 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 da. And you could just feel it pumping out of the speakers. Turn it up. You could feel the 60 and you could feel the 220. And then you could feel this kind of 110 pumping in the middle. You know, whether it was right or not, I just love that imagery. And Dave Jordan's one of the greatest engineers and producers of all time. So I'll trust him. So... 1073 cannot be ignored as one of the greatest and probably most important EQs ever made. Right. Now, we've talked a lot about your favorites in each category. Microphone, preamp, compressor, EQ. Desert Island. You can only pick one of each category forever. Out of all the ones that we spoke about today. That is so unfair. I know. That's why I asked. That is so unfair because I have different distinctions for me. It's like the Swiss Army knife compressor. We all know is a distressor. Absolutely. Yeah. I don't think there's an engineer alive that would would that has used all the compressors that we love that would argue with that point. I, every studio I go into has a pair of distressors. Sometimes, I think when I was at electric, no, at Quad with Michael Brow, I feel like there was one rack that was only distressors. But what preamp are you putting into that? <sighs> You see, this, this comes down to matter of taste. Mm. And my matter of taste is definitely a Neve 1073. Okay. And if it's a gun to the head, I do like the BAE one because I, I kind of grew up professionally using that. In 99, 2000, when they first came out, it was originally they took the original Neve and just rebuilt them and made them beautiful and brand new again. Before anybody else was doing, you know, quote unquote clones, they were building original ones. But I do understand that budget is a constraint. So, you know, shop around on what you can afford. A 1073 is the way to go. And it solves both your problems. So what are you shaping as far as EQ goes wise? Uh, you know, well, that's after, the point. After, it yeah. solves both the problems because <laughs> it is a mic pre 
and an EQ. But if you only had the mic free for the 1073, okay. but you had to shape it with an EQ. That wasn't the 1073? That was not the 1073. Ah, you see, that's, that's a trick, because the 1073, to me, is the all-in-one. That's a difficult one, because I do feel like five, uh, 560s, the graphic, API graphic, might do the job. It's just a little bit of a, it's a little fiddly. You got this much movement on a graphic. <laughs> <sighs> if it's only one EQ, I'm going through so much stuff. If I've got all the time in the world and I really want to do everything and it's only one EQ, it might be the GML. Okay. Because the GML can do everything. I mean, just look at it. I mean, it, yeah. is, it can get into every single frequency. So I could think about it in terms of API and Neve EQ points and select them on the tracking in. Sure. But then I can also use it on the mix and I'll also put it on the master bus. It is one of the greatest EQs ever made. And George Massenberg can get a genius status just for making that one particular thing. Mm. It is in every studio I've ever been in that's worth its salt. It's an amazing, amazing EQ. And then I'll throw you a softball pitch. You're recording vocals. Yeah. As far as the microphone goes, I, you know, we, the industry standard, if you will, has always been a UA7. Yeah. yeah. But there are some more, there's younger microphones that have come out, you know, more recent ones that have come out. Stuff like, you know, like we've talked about the UA7, we've talked about the Atlantis, we've talked mm -hmm. about Lewid, we've talked about Austrian audio. Yeah. For vocals, you could only have one vocal condenser microphone. Are you going with the U87 or are you going with something a bit more new? Well, herein lies the problem. Because the more I think about this, there was a mic that we didn't talk about mm. in our list. Yeah, so my I, attention. Yeah, I'm going to ruin <laughs> it for you. It's probably the 1040. It's probably the Lewitt 1040. Okay. Because the 1040 is incredibly versatile. The only thing with the 1040 is, and I love this microphone, is it doesn't quite go as far. When it goes dark, it's not as dark as I want it to be. When it goes bright, it's not as bright as I want it to be. Okay. They were a little conservative on it, but it is one of the most versatile microphones ever made. But if you don't care about budget, then obviously the red is going to take some beating. Okay. Very difficult to answer this so specifically because... You know, gun to your head, everybody's going to say, anybody worth their salt's going to be like, you know, probably going to be a U87 into a Neve 1073, which covers EQ as well, and an 1176. 1176. 87, 1073, 1176. If any engineer, that's going to be, it's not going to be what every engineer says, but if there's 100 engineers asked that have been making records for 30 or 40 years, that's going to be a correlation you're going to see. 87, 1073, 1176. It's going to come up over and over again. Whether it's all three, you know, the 100 people, 40 will say that. And then another 40 will say one of those three things. Right. And then the last 20 will say two of the three things. That's, going, that's really going to be very, very popular choice. And as much as I love the Distressor, it is the Swiss Army knife. Gun to my head, and 1176 is my favorite, favorite compressor. Mm. There's just something about how it works in a limit mode which is second to none. So I can use it specifically to limit on 20 to one, or I can gently use it on vocals on three to one and guitars and everything in between. There is a reason why that 50 plus year old compressor is still being used and modeled and cloned to this day. Not because it looks pretty, because it sounds bleeding awesome. It sounds absolutely fantastic. Um, it just adds a little tiny bit of grit, not too much, just enough excitement. Um, it's attack and release times are fast for mod fast enough for modern music where things like LA2As are very specific and very slow attack and release times. This can get in there and really work with modern stuff. And it's dumb and easy to use. It's a fixed threshold compressor. So you can just turn up and it's just, here's a compression. Just keep turning it up. The more louder it gets, the more it compresses. It's your gateway drug into using a compressor. <laughs> if you can really? use an 1176, you can take the knowledge you've got from using the att variable attack and release from the fixed threshold, compression, through all of the different uh, ratios, etc. You can learn that and then take the knowledge from that compressor and apply it to others. Highly recommend it. So um, Ryan spontaneously combust did and it's turned into a world-class engineer. How are you? Hi. 
Always great to see you, my friend. Great to be here. So we were having a discussion about EQs. Yep. And favorite EQs. And I, I think I mentioned like 1073 EQ is, is, is one of my favorites and very usable on API EQs, obviously, because they sort of, they're like jigsaw puzzles. You get a 1073 and you go 60 hertz on the kick, you go 110 on the, on the bass guitar and you go 220 on the bottom of the snare and you're kind of tied in your low end. Well, and then I thought to myself, there is an EQ that I lust after and it's made by our good friends, Chandler. Wade's company, yep. and of course it's based on this insanely huge mastering EQ that the engineers at Abbey Road discovered in the mastering thing and stole it and started recording with it. And it's enormous, and we've seen the real thing. And this is their version of it, the Curve Bender. You had one of these, didn't you? No, uh, so I, I'm a huge fan of all the stuff that Wade does. I love uh, all of the TG stuff. Owned every piece of TG gear except this. You've never owned this. No, and I've always, I've never even plugged one in, and I've l lusted after this piece of gear. So I, I can't speak on it. But, oh, I plugged them in. But I want to use it on everything. So It's pretty amazing. The, the first time I ever saw one and heard one was quite early on. It was when I was working with Dave Sardi, and we were mixing at Dave Way's old studio, The Pass, on a Neve 8078, and I think he had this on his master bus, and he was just doing a little pick at the top on both channels, like a little, you know, a little uh, um, low boost and, a, and some tiny bit of low mid cut. Yeah. And in and out was like magic. I mean, pretty phenomenal. Yeah, I mean, I feel like all the TG, like the EMI style circuitry that's inside of this on top of the... Yep the EQ is going to just make this a magic box. Um, I, you know, two bus magic and, you know, having the high pass, low pass, and then the four bands of EQ and a little bit of gain, like that's a lot of flexibility to do some cool stuff. So yeah, this stuff is amazing. And the relationship between Chandler and Abbey Road is insane. They really work super close together to make this stuff basically as amazing as it can be. Yeah. Yeah, anyway, so I didn't want to miss that out, and I didn't want to miss out the opportunity to bring Sean in to talk about it as well. But yeah, when it comes to EQs, look, it's not a cheap EQ, but it's pretty darn amazing. So thanks ever so much, Sean. Yeah, my pleasure to be here. Thanks, Ryan, wherever you disappeared to. And uh, check out the link below to all of these beautiful pieces of gear that we've been talking about. So long, farewell, have a good day, au revoir, adios, goodbye.